Hi, this is Jim Cunningham. Welcome to Ira Tips. Get creative with your RMD or required minimum distribution strategies. I have Christina Lindsay here with me. And together, we're going to take you on a wild ride of all of these tips to minimize taxes. So very important. I'm a lawyer. Christina Lindsay is a financial professional. This is not advice. So don't look at this and go out and do a bunch of stuff. It's a really bad idea. Uh, always, always seek out an expert before you uh, do any moves on, on the materials that we're going to discuss here. I'm the managing partner, Cunningham Legal, over 25 years experience. We have offices throughout California. We are licensed in, in other jurisdictions, including California. I'm a certified specialist in estate planning, trust and probate law, real estate broker, securities and insurance licensed. Also a pilot, Christina Lindsay is the CEO and president of Ascent Wealth Management. And she is a certified financial planner as well as a certified kingdom advisors um, designation. So Christina, great to have you here again with us. Go ahead, if you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you're watching this live, you can go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A. If you're watching this on YouTube, please put your comments or questions in the comments and we will answer mm -hmm. those, uh, address those. These are the lawyers in our firm and we are in in devoted entirely to all things trusts and estates and, and uh, income and death tax planning. So with that, Christina, um, let's talk about, there's been a lot of change in an area that you and I uh, spend time on, and I'm not kidding, daily in our practices, it's likely every hour of our workday, we're looking at these issues because many of our clients, Christina, uh, are looking at RMDs at some point in their right in their lifetime, and that's a required minimum distribution. So the money that you save while you're working in a 401k or an IRA, uh, once you um, aren't working anymore, right, and you, you hit 72, you have to start taking money out of these retirement accounts, these IRAs, mm -hmm. these, uh, Roths, what we're well, not the Roth, but the IRAs and other type accounts. So Christina, I'll, I'll let you take it from here. Sounds good, Jim. So yeah, in uh, 2018 was the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And in 2019, there was the, the SECURE Act that was passed. And so it changed um, the RMD, which is the required minimum distribution that you're required to take from an IRA, 401k, 457, 403b, any kind of a pre-tax um, pre-tax, meaning you have never paid the tax. You took a tax deduction, you'd had less taxable earnings and you deferred those earnings and they grew without taxation. And ultimately they're taxed when you take them out. So sometimes people use certain planning techniques such as moving to a different low tax state when they're taking their distributions because you do pay both uh, federal and state income tax. So some clients that are in California that are paying 12 plus, you know, percent income tax at the state level can at least save a little bit of those taxes. But ultimately what the IRS is trying to do is to make sure that you spend down those assets and pay in your fair share of tax revenue um, at, during your lifetime. So it used to be 70 and a half that has been pushed to age 72 and under the SECURE Act, and there is a SECURE Act 2.0 that is being rumored to go through Congress. And uh, there's discussion of pushing that to age 75. Now, whether that'll go through, when that'll go through, you know, to, to be determined, but all that that's going to do is increase the amount that has to come out annually. So it's just kicking the can down the road a little bit longer, maybe giving you a little bit more time to plan for it. Um, but it is currently age 72. In part of the SECURE Act, the main thing that we're having to plan for now is the stretch was eliminated, essentially, the stretch IRA rule, which meant that, um, you know, if a, if a spouse dies, then the IRA or retirement plan is treated as your own for the surviving spouse. Once you have no spouse as a beneficiary, and it's a non-spousal beneficiary, then typically what used to be the case was that non-spousal beneficiary could then treat that IRA as a lifetime distribution. They had access to take out more when they wanted to and pay the tax when they wanted to, but they were required to take out a distribution every year, but it was a little bit over their lifetime based on their life expectancy. 
that has been replaced with what is now the 10 year payout rule. There's exceptions, you know, for minors and special needs and those kinds of things. So there are some exceptions to the rule, but it's primarily giving you a 10 year window to take that money out. So if you essentially are a non-spousal beneficiary, let's just say that you're 50, you have until age 60 to fully empty out that IRA. And at that 10 year, if you do it all in one lump sum, everything will continue to grow tax deferred until that 10th year. And at the end of that 10th calendar year, you are required to take out everything in its entirety. And so it does require some technique, you know, do we do this over three years, five years, do we do this, you know, maybe you're, um, you know, 55 and you're going to retire at 65. So you don't need any additional earned income um, during those 10 years. And we want to, it's more strategic to take it out at the end of your uh, 10th year, because you're not going to have any taxable earned income that would compound a potential tax problem. So this is really where we're spending a lot of our time is helping our clients prepare for those future required distributions that they are required to take with their own retirement funds, as well as looking at what can we do to set their beneficiaries up for success and heirs. Or if you have inherited an IRA, how can we start planning for uh, when to take out those distributions and how to help mitigate taxes? Yeah, I mean, uh, Christina, you're you're raising some really important points that our clients are very concerned about. And it used to be that when you inherited an IRA, you could take those payments out, drip those out over a lifetime, which means a lot more money in the person who's inheriting the IRA, a lot more money in, in his or her pocket. Now, everything's got to come out after 10 years, unless you're chronically ill, uh, have special needs, uh, or are a minor. Um, and so the rules are not getting easier. The rules are getting more complex. And unfortunately, we just released my second edition of my book and we updated all the IRA language. And then the government, of course, has to go change it. So, you know. Yeah, actually, on, on that note, before we kind of move ahead for just a moment, there is, you'll, you'll probably hear a lot of um, uncertainty as to exactly what's going on with this 10 year rule because. Um, while this was passed in 2019, and then you add a pandemic on top of it and a new administration, it's it's taken um, a lot of time to actually get clarity from the IRS. So in February um, last month, February 23rd, the IRS published a 270 page paper on how they're going to actually handle this 10 year payout and it's still in its comment period. So it's not finalized in all certainty yet. Um, so there's some things that are still unclear that are proposed by the IRS is if the IRA owner had already started required distributions, let's just say that they were 80 and they were already taking an annual RMD before they passed away. It was unclear, are they going to be required to take out an annual distribution under the beneficiary's life expectancy and still do an annual RMD, but then at the end of the 10 years, you have to still empty that IRA. The 10-year rule is, is certain that the IRA has to be emptied out at the end of that 10th year, again, unless there's those special circumstances, um, special needs trust, those types of things. And the tenure doesn't start, if you're a minor, it doesn't start till after age 21. So there's some, some exceptions there. But the main thing that we're keeping our eye on is custodians and the where the IRAs are custodied, you know, whether it be at TD Ameritrade, Charles Schwab, Wells Fargo, wherever the IRA is held, custodians have not required an annual required distribution in that 10 year window. The IRS is saying if there was no required distribution on the IRA owner prior to death, it will probably only be a 10 year rule. If required distributions had already started, the IRS would like to still get some income and they would like you to still pay a required distribution each year during that 10 year time frame and be subject to the 10 year rule. So that's still unclear. And, and, and we're waiting on final clarity on that. Yeah, we have some questions and, and we say clarity. I, I will tell you, Christina, this is, I will say as, as a lawyer, it's if understanding these rules is up there with understanding partnership taxation, partnership taxation is the most complex area of tax law. I would say this is probably the most complex area 
of, of a state planning law because there it's such shifting sands, right? There are no, we, we get a rule and then we get another, the IRS changes their position and then there's a new law and it just keeps changing year over year. Anonymous asks, you mentioned some exceptions for the 10 year payout. How will this work for a special needs trust? Anonymous, we have a, uh, on our YouTube page, uh, I did a, a webinar with Daniel Van Slyke on special needs trusts. This is very important. If you have a loved one with special needs and you leave your IRA to a normal special needs trust, all that money may have to come out in one year. What you need to do is leave it to a special special needs trust. And that's what we call it in, inside our law firm, a special special needs trust that has the correct language that allows you to stretch those payments out over the lifetime of the loved one with special needs. So it's very important. If you have an IRA and you're leaving that IRA to a special needs trust, you really need to seek out an expert lawyer. And, and in our firm, we have several lawyers with expertise in this area, but that special needs trust has to contain special provisions because normally if a person who inherits an IRA to benefit from these the 10 year stretch out or the lifetime or whatever it is, the person inheriting the IRA must be a human being with a heartbeat. When you leave an IRA to a trust, the IRS lets you do that if the trust is written in a certain way it lets you look through the trust to the beneficiary, and that's the one receiving the inheritance. The IRS lets you look through that trust to the beneficiary in order to qualify for the stretch out. If it's a normal trust, that's not going to happen. All right. So it's very important. Um, and that's something we can certainly help you with. Anita asks now if you, if inherited, do beneficiaries that are not minors have to comply with the 10 year rule? And does the 10 year rule apply if the deceased pulled out three years? Um, if they were into their minimum distributions three years and do you have seven left, how does that work? I think we answered that, Christina. Um, we're not sure, but it looks like if you have started your RMDs, as Christina said, your, uh, the people who inherit have to take out a minimum distribution for nine tax years, beginning the tax year after your death, for nine tax years. And then in that 10th tax year, which is the 11th calendar year, in that 10th tax year, all the money has to come out. And I will tell you, Christina, I know we're going to talk about this, but if, if you're watching this and you have not thought about a Roth IRA, about converting your IRA to a Roth IRA, I would say this is really, really important because when you run the math on it, and really it's a mathematical calculation, um, your family may be much better off with you having converted to a Roth. And we'll, we'll talk about that. So we have another question here. Will the IRA Legacy Trust allow converting your IRA to a Roth IRA? Uh, you can't do a, if I inherit an IRA, I can't convert that to a Roth. Correct, Christina? Correct. You can't the do it post, yeah. post modem. And, and an IRA trust, to be clear, a lot of, there's sometimes confusion, I know, uh, with clients thinking that the IRA trust is in effect while they're living. The IRA trust really doesn't go into effect until the IRA owner and the spousal beneficiary, if there is one, until both the IRA owner and spousal beneficiary are deceased, that's when the IRA trust springs into effect. So if you already have a, if you have an IRA that's inherited and currently is in an IRA trust, meaning the IRA owners are decedent, then you can't do a conversion postmortem. No. And then we had a question in our chat is, do you, do you have to withdraw hundred percent or just the amount when the person passed away? I think what you're asking Arthur is, do you have to withdraw, um, you know, if the IRA is worth 100,000 when you die and then it's worth 200,000 10 years later, you have to take out 200,000. You're not just taking out the 100,000. You got to take out the whole. And, you know, folks, there used to not even be minimum distribution rules, right? Back in the 80s, there, there were no dis minimum distribution rules. So exactly. So kind of moving along here, um, these rules exist for both traditional and Roth IRAs. The only difference is the Roth will always be tax-free. So that's really where we'll talk about that in a moment. And there is some clients that make sense to do a Roth conversion. Some it does not. It just depends on the situation and, and your um, ability to mitigate taxes or your willingness to pay taxes. So um, that really requires some careful analysis. But you know, beneficiary considerations. Um, couple of reasons why we like the IRA trust, uh, in particular, when people have decent sized 
IRAs, you know, they're worth protecting. So it was really, um, you know, the Supreme Court ruled in 2015 that IRAs are no longer inherited IRAs are no longer creditor protected. And so um, that's really one of the main benefits. And a lot of times people will say, well, I'm not really afraid of getting sued, but you could be in one bad accident and blow through an umbrella policy. And, um, you know, we live in a litigious society, unfortunately. So an IRA trust does offer that creditor protection. It also um, can mitigate, you know, spendthrift provisions, because if you do have someone that inherits that while they can take money out at any moment in time, if you have a trust, it can control how much they're able to take out so that they're not spending it down and paying excessive taxes um, unnecessarily. So the other thing that is unique, if you do have an IRA trust, the rules are that at the end of the 10 years, the money has to come out of an IRA account. You could still have an IRA trust and that could be the account owner. But what could happen at the end of 10 years is that IRA trust could be the owner and it can go into a non-qualified, non-retirement, just regular trust account that's named in the name of the IRA trust. And that's when we have a corporate trustee in the state of Nevada. One of the reasons why we use a corporate trustee in a no, no state income tax state is because it gives the beneficiaries tax control. So ultimately, the federal government's just saying this has to come out of an IRA at the end of year 10. But if you live in California, and let's just say you're retiring in 15 years, you don't want to be subject to a 13% state income tax. You can then have that money sit in the IRA trust account and wait to distribute the money to yourself until you're in a, in a lower tax bracket or a different you know, state income tax situation. So having an IRA trust, not only does it give you the creditor protection, spendthrift provisions, it certainly accommodates special needs beneficiaries, but it does give tax control to the beneficiary. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, the example there is if, if someone's 60 and they inherit an IRA uh, from their parents, in an IRA trust that's cited in Nevada, uh, when the money comes out, when that person who inherits the IRA is 70, right? You're going to pay federal tax on that money. But if it's not distributed to the 70 year, 70 year old California resident, then there's no California tax pay tax paid. So if that 70 year old says, Hey, I'm going to go fishing in Florida for three years, you can then take the money out, mm -hmm. right? You can take the money out. And, and avoid payment of state income tax. Exactly. So we have anonymous asks, while, while the IRA owner is alive, will the IRA legacy trust allow conversion to a Roth IRA? Is it better to convert to Roth IRA before putting it in the IRA legacy trust? How much is a decent size IRA? Anonymous, the IRA trust does not receive the IRA until you die, right? So if you're the participant, it's your IRA, you got a million bucks in that IRA, uh, you pass away, that's when the money goes into the IRA trust. So it's a little bit different than a living trust where you put your assets into your trust during lifetime. This is funded at death. And how much is a decent sized IRA? I did a, um, a special needs trust with a special special needs trust for a client who had a $50,000 IRA. Okay. Now, some people may say, well, that's not much money, but knowing that that $50,000 would knock that kid off of, of um, public assistance benefits it needed to go to a special needs trust and we didn't want to have to pay, you know, 10, 15, $20,000 in taxes. So we fit for, in that case, 50 was appropriate. I would say that realistically though, um, if, if each person's inheriting more than a hundred or 200,000, that's where it starts making sense. Right? So if you got 10 kids and you got a $500,000 IRA, I'm not sure it makes sense. Uh, but you know, if, if each person's inheriting more than a hundred or 200,000, it starts making sense. So, exactly. All right. So a couple of things that people can do to mitigate their taxes on required distributions. You know, one of the things that um, was challenging for some with the, with the new tax laws was that they, a lot of times people would say, well, I lost my itemized deductions. And so one of the, the ways in which if you do not itemize on your taxes, you can actually mitigate some taxable income by doing a qualified charitable distributions. Sometimes this makes sense even if you itemize because a qualified charitable distribution um, 
acts much like, you know, kind of um, when you were earning your income and you were putting all this money away in your 401k all those years, you put away, you know, $27,000 a year when you're over age 50 is the new limit. And that was reducing your taxable earned income. So you essentially paid less taxes because you were deferring that income to future years. A qualified charitable distribution also reduces the amount of taxable income. So let's just say, for example, that your required distribution is 140,000 for the year, which may seem high, but unfortunately we're seeing that more and more um, regularly, that people have these very large required distributions. And what you can do is up to $100,000 can be directed directly to charity. So it goes straight from your IRA directly to a 501c3. And what that does is it doesn't make that recognized as income. So if you have $140,000 required distribution, rather than recognizing $140,000, you recognize 40. The limit is $100,000 but you can put up to $100,000 into qualified charitable distributions. This cannot, one caveat is this cannot go to a donor advised fund. So if it's a qualified charitable distribution and you do not itemize on your taxes, uh, you cannot have that go to a donor advised fund. So this is something that we do with so several of our clients and it can also reduce your tax bracket. Yeah, and actually, this is a great thing. I know that um, uh, you know many people are watching here. You you go to a church, a synagogue, a mosque, and and it's a charitable organization. Many people tithe or they give to their um, you know where their their places of worship. And I would say many smaller organizations don't have this set up. So if you're like, wow, this sounds really good. Uh, that's where you're, you're the person who's in charge of the finances at the at maybe you know the church or mosque or synagogue you would want to reach out to that person and, and connect them with somebody. And, and do they, do they just go to a, like a TD Ameritrade or a Schwab and, and set it up is how does, how does that work, Christina? It's really your, your IRA. Um, so if I'm making a, a tithe to a church from, from my IRA, I would mm -hmm. have the, my custodian TD Ameritrade make a third party mm -hmm. check, go directly to that charity. Okay. So that's, so if somebody says, Hey, this sounds great. Instead of, and, and here's, here's kind of, this is a, a little bit of mindfulness about taxation. If you're giving 10,000 a month to your church, right? Or, or a hundred thousand a year to your church, look at it. It may be better for you to give this directly from your IRA or not. It just depends. Yep. Like, you just can't do it until you're 70 and a half. So you have to be 70 and a half to have qualified chair, what we refer to as QCD, a QCD, which is a qualified charitable distribution cannot be done until you're. 70 and a half and the limit is a hundred thousand dollars a year so if you're 65 retired early and said i want to start giving from my ira you can do that but it wouldn't count as a qualified charitable distribution which means you just do not have to recognize it as income so that's you know we have some tax software that we use for our clients um so for all of our existing clients we do that as part of our analysis when we're looking at the required distributions we run their tax return through our software and just say, okay, if you did, I see your charitable giving, or maybe you're not charitable, but if you did $10,000 as a QCD, it would bring you down to the next tax bracket. So we can look at analyzing that, at least we do for our clients. Um, so charitable me, options. Hold on, let me ask you. So how much, if, if just to kind of, I'm anticipating some questions that people might have, they might say, you know, I'd really like to sponsor that mission trip. And I'd really like to put 25,000 toward that. And I'm 70 and I'm over 70 and a half. Can you control how the money's spent? I mean, how, what sort of, or is it just this unrestricted gift? What Christina, what do you, what do you say? Or is it, do you just work that out on the back end? It really depends on the charity. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you're giving to the American Red Cross, you're not going to have a whole lot of control. Oh, yeah, right. But, well, you, it goes to help Ukrainian refugees or something, right? Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. All right. All right, we have a few questions, so we'll go through these. These are kind of quick. I thought it was better not to put the IRA into a living trust. That is correct. So what is an IRA trust relative to a living trust? A, a IRA trust is a special, specially built trust that is not a living trust. It is a totally different animal that is designed to receive a deceased person's IRA when that person passes away. 
and it does so in a manner that is friendly, right, to the IRS, and the IRS lets you be protected by all of these, um, the 10-year rule or the lifetime stretch, whatever it is. Uh, but it has to be very particularly crafted. And I'll tell you, I took over an attorney's practice who retired, and he was in the middle of a, a case with the IRS, and it was a disaster. The IRA, the IRA was left to a living trust. Some people died out of order, which often does happen. And um, the trust ended up having to pay a lot more taxes because the IRA was left to a living trust. And I asked the two attorneys who were on uh, several calls, I asked them if we had done an IRA legacy trust, would we have these problems? The answer is no. So it, it's real, folks. Uh, can you give to more than one charity? Yes, but I think you're capped at 100, right? Right. If the RMD age changes to 72 from 70 and a half, which it has, uh, what can be done? Uh, can what can be done from 72? I'm not sure. I think it was a little bit of typo in there. What is the RMD upon age 70 and a half? What is the required RMD upon age 70 and a half? So if you're born after July 1, if you were born after July 1, 1949, your minimum, your uh, your 72 when your minimum distributions. Happen if you're before born before July 1, 1949, you're under the old rules. And then Kerr says, how much does it cost to set up an IRA trust? I would say it's it's typically about the cost of setting up a normal estate plan. So in, in our office, clients with a living trust, if we do a living trust and an IRA trust, you're probably five to nine thousand, frankly, depending if you're married or single. And so it is it effectively kind of doubles the the, the fees increases about 40%, 50%, 70, somewhere in there, the fees. It's, it's basically a duplicate estate plan for, uh, for your, um, in addition to your living trust. Can you use the $16,000 yearly tax exemption so no taxes on either side? Um, Arthur, that you can gift 16,000. This would be to a non-charity. This would be a person. And that's just a gift. So you pay taxes on the money and, and that 16,000 that you're giving, you're not getting a deduction. Um, what is the typical cost in taxes to convert an IRA to a Roth? I'll let you take that one. Helen asks. Um, yeah, let's let's table that one so that we can kind of go through that in a little bit more detail as far as some other options as far as mitigating taxes and conversions. So before we get there, let's let's um, talk about two. If you do itemize. Mm -hmm. So if you do itemize, obviously the standard deduction went up significantly for married filing jointly. And then if you're over age 65, it's even higher. And so a lot of times clients don't itemize anymore. Um, or if they're, especially if they're retired, they don't, or if they're not self-employed, they may not have as many itemized deductions. If you're above those standard deductions, you may want to consider, or if you do a lot of charitable giving to really maximize what you're giving is, let's just say that you give a certain amount each year and you know, you know, this mission or charity, they're doing a building fund, or they really need an extra gift this year, you may want to lump your gifts of what you do on an annual basis into one year so that you can itemize that deduction mm -hmm. and mitigate some taxes. And so those types of itemized deductions can go to a donor advised fund. Now, a donor advised fund would also be a great way if you're going to lump a bunch of gifts into one year a donor advised fund is a great way to do that because a donor advised fund, what that is, is it's a charitable, you get a charitable deduction. If you put hundred thousand dollars in a donor advised fund, you're going to get to deduct hundred thousand in that tax year. Anything in that fund is going to grow and it's not going to generate any taxes as long as it comes out and goes directly to a 501c3. So anything that comes out of the donor advised fund goes directly to a 501c3, but there's no annual giving requirement. So you could do, say you do your tithing, again, $30,000 a year, you could do 90,000 in one tax year, get that $90,000 deduction, put it in the donor advised fund, invest the money in mutual funds, it'll grow. And then each year thereafter, distribute that on an annual basis, as opposed to doing it um, outside of a donor advised fund. So that's a way to potentially lump um, and bunch your gifts into one year and get maybe maybe larger deductions. There are more complex strategies such as you know charitable lead trusts, charitable remainder trusts, and that really requires a lot more one-on-one -on -one analysis. If we're dealing with, in particular, if we're dealing with amounts that are over a million, is kind of that threshold of where we typically look at a charitable strategy that might be more of a um, a trust structure. Yeah, and you know, Christina, as you're talking, I'm 
I'm reminded of all of the wealthy clients that I've had and, and the patterns that I see in clients who, who create a, a lasting legacy. And I think it's important if you're watching this, it's important to understand that I think most of the time when it comes to taxes, we have a single year mindset, which is what are my taxes this year? You know, Christina and I, when we work with clients, we're looking at what are your taxes going to be over a 20 year period or a 30 year period, right? And so there are things that you can do in, in a given year that have benefits in future years uh, or things that have, you know, benefit you this year. And, and then the example is giving to a donor advised fund. What is a donor advised fund? Okay. Uh, a donor advised fund is attached to a, a charity, a public charity, and it's a bucket of money that you can set up your own account with this charity instead of just giving it to the charity and, and kind of, you know, going into their general fund, it's a separate account. And the reason it's called a donor advised fund is you can put a hundred thousand or a million or 10,000 or whatever it is and take the deduction in the year that you make the contribution. So we're in year 2022 right now. That means you can make a contribution in 2022, get the full deduction, even though the money is not paid to charities until later years. And so that's the real key distinction. And it's a donor advised fund because if you're the donor, you advise the charity on where you would like the money to go. And as long as you're not trying to sponsor a balloon party, um, I think most donor advised funds, uh, the money goes, as long as it's going to a 501c3. It has year. to go to a 501c3, yeah. But you could create your own donor advised fund. That could be done in a year that you decide to do a Roth conversion. You decide to say, I'm going to convert. I know it's going to generate a lot of taxes. So to offset that, I'm also going to do a donor advised fund. And you could call it the Cunningham Private Family Foundation or, you know, donor advised fund. You could say the Cunningham Foundation, Family Foundation Donor Advised Fund. You can name it whatever you'd like, um, as long as the money does go out to a 501c3. So let's talk about maybe some Roth conversion strategies. And I think that that's really where there's a lot of focus, um, a lot of questions, especially once people are staring down uh, that tax bill and um, looking at a real tangible tax bill for what these required distributions are going to generate. And so Roth conversions, what that means is, is you're basically taking money out of your pre-tax bucket and putting it into a tax-free bucket. Now, a Roth IRA, it just means that you have to pay the tax at the time of the conversion. A lot of higher income earners are prohibited from contributing to a Roth because they make too much money. And um, what the IRS has said, though, is you are, at least currently, there's not a limit on converting. And so you can, if you make too much money, you can still convert as long as you pay the tax. And so what we like to do is how can we potentially mitigate that tax? Does it, does that client have a break-even point? Um, to what extent can we mitigate the tax and what time do they have to recover that tax bill due to make it worthwhile? And so what there is a lot of pending legislation that has not been even passed, finalized, got to a form of a final bill, um, there is so much proposed that has been changed and line itemed that I can't even tell you what will be, if any, restrictions on these. And so it makes our job very difficult because um, it's kind of like we didn't know if capital gains were going to get raised last year and it could have been retroactive. Well, we're sitting in a situation at this point in time in March of 2022 where there could be policy that is retroactive to January 1 of 2022 and we still don't know what that will look like. It's becoming less and less likely um, between now and midterm elections. However, depending on what the outcome is of midterm elections, could there be change there, that's retroactive? There could be. So we're very cautious when it comes to Roth conversions and what we're doing at this moment in time. It, it looks as if there could be limitations um, that that loophole, if you will, is closed in 2029. I've also heard 2020 or 2032. So none of that is finalized. But we're kind of working in our office under the assumption that this loophole might be closed by 2029, kind of like we're hearing that there might be mandatory distributions, doesn't matter what your age is, if you have a mega Roth or a mega IRA. 
anything that is a retirement account that's 10 million or more, we're hearing that there could be legislation that requires a distribution, even if you're 50, it doesn't matter, they're gonna start forcing you to take money out. And so we're under that assumption that 2029 is kind of our window between now and 2029. If we're gonna do a Roth conversion, we wanna do it in that window. And it appears that they're gonna limit Roth conversions for anyone that has, uh, at least in the married filing jointly tax bracket that may earns over 450. If you have earned income. Now, if you're retired, you're on a pension and you're just gonna do a conversion, there's probably not gonna be as much of a limitation, but it looks as if if you're earning over 450 and you wanna do a conversion, that could be a problem. So that's all pending. There's been nothing finalized on that front at this moment in time. So I can't speak with complete clarity on what that will look like. But for example, on a Roth conversion strategy, some people are in a perfect window to do that. And uh, in particular, if you're over 59 and a half, mm -hmm. because there's no 10% penalty on taking money out of an IRA, if you're over 59 and a half, once it goes to a Roth, the five-year rule is critical. So you can't take money out of that Roth account for five years um, tax-free. And you typically wouldn't want to. You want to allow that money that you converted to get into that tax-free vehicle time to marinate and really grow more than what the tax consequence was. So most people, that's not a not an issue, but we do want to make sure they've got the five years to not touch that money if they're gonna do a conversion. And a couple other benefits once money is in a Roth is there's no required distribution. And there's no required distribution for um, the spouse. And the other main thing is there's no IRD tax. Now we get, you know, what's IRD tax? IRD tax is income in respect of the decedent. And so if you had, let's just say that you passed away, you had a $5 million IRA and you had an estate that was $10 million. Now you're over the estate tax ex lifetime exemption for yourself as a single individual, you've got a $15 million that IRA is lumped into your taxable estate. So it's part of your estate tax calculation and because it's money that's never been taxed, it was income that was generated by the decedent. It's income they deferred and has never been taxed. Then you're also going to have income tax paid by the beneficiary. So it's kind of a double taxation thing. If you are in a very high estate, IRD tax can be a pretty negative hit because you're going to have extra taxes paid by the beneficiary. So yeah, you know, Christina, you're 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 hitting on something that we talk about a lot with clients. In 2026, the amount you can leave tax free is cut in half, and that'll be about six million dollars. And you know, if you have a three million dollar IRA and a three million dollar house and three million in the bank, poof, you have a taxable estate, and you're going to have to pay tax. The idea is to wait on these IRAs until the last moment when you have to take money out, just on a high, very high level. That's so what most people problem, do. Yeah, the problem is if you wait 10 years to take money out of the IRA, you're going to have to pay death tax on the full value of that IRA, okay? Well, you won't. Your heirs will, right? Your estate will. And then that money that you've paid taxes on, you got to pay income tax on it. So this is all about economic modeling. It's about math. This is not a do-it-yourself project. Uh, you need to be connected with someone like Christina, who's a certified financial planner. That's really the gold star of, of uh, you know, the uh, in terms of quality of, of training on running the math on this. And this is frankly, purely a math calculation. So if you're in that situation where you've got potentially a taxable estate and you have a non-converted IRA, you know, a regular IRA, not a Roth, you might be better off converting that to a Roth paying the tax because that money you pay in tax is not taxed when you die at 40%. So we have some questions. Sandra asks, what is the calculation for RMD? It's based on age. So the older you are, the bigger, the larger the percentage, right? So someone who's 90 has a, has a larger minimum distribution on the same sized account as someone who's 72. 
So someone who's 90 is going to take out a bigger piece of the pie. It's with based IRA- on the uniform, uniform lifetime table that the IRS publishes. Mm-hmm. With the IRA trust, do you name the IRA trust as beneficiary for the IRA 401k and Roth IRA? Yes, that's what we do. So it's a beneficiary designation. After the spouse. After the spouse, typically, yes. If your trust beneficiary is not a U.S. resident, are they required to pay taxes to the IRS? Yes. All right. That's, uh, well, it actually, it depends. <laughs> uh, what happens if someone's, let's say somebody lives in, uh, uh, in Mexico. They're not a U.S. citizen. They're, they always grew up in Mexico. They, they live there. They got a house. They got a family. They inherit an IRA. How does that work, Christina, with a foreign beneficiary of an IRA? They're still going to have to pay federal tax. Um, now, to the extent that there's an estate tax due as well, sometimes there's, you know, um, foreign credits to some extent, it just, it really depends on the individual situation, but you don't avoid paying our, our the United States, you know, it U.S. Does. Treasury, unless, you know, if, if it's income that's never been taxed, the I, you know, the IRS is going to get their pound. So Anita asks, what if you don't have very large IRAs and want to leave them to your heirs? What's the best way to minimize tax liabilities on them? Name them individually, okay? Also let them know, but here's the problem. If you name somebody individually, the person, that individual person has to do a bunch of stuff, okay? Um, and a lot of people don't even know what the, they don't know what they don't know, right? And, and that's really the conundrum. Anonymous asks, does the charity have to spend the money on what the donor to the donor advised fund fund specifies. So does the charity have to spend the money in the way that the donor orders? No, it is a donor advised fund. So the charity has ultimate discretion, but in the real world, if it's a 501c3, again, if you say, hey, I wanna do a balloon party for my next door neighbor, not gonna happen, all right? If you wanna leave it to the SPCA, then you know that's a 501c3. Is the deadline for giving charitable donation for 2021 tax filing December 31, 2021? Is it too late to donate for 2021? It is. The qualified charitable distributions have to be done by 1231. Uh, If the B subtrust isn't an appropriate beneficiary for the IRA, what are the other reasons to eliminate the B trust in an AB trust? Uh, It depends. Um, The big downside with the B trust is if if an asset's worth a dollar, when it goes into the B trust, when that surviving spouse passes away and it's worth $3, the kids get stuck with the capital gains tax on the $2 profit. So that's the downside. If it's in the survivor's trust or if it's in the individual surviving spouse's name individually, when the kids inherit that thing that's worth $3, no capital gains tax. Danilo asks, if both husband and wife pass away, how much time will the contingent beneficiaries have to empty their inherited IRA? Great question, Danilo. Um, So, when a person passes away in a given year, let's say a person passes away in 2022, by September 30th of 2023, the people who are entitled to inherit the IRA must be identified. And here's where it gets a little tricky. If you say, I leave this IRA to my son, and then your son passes away, if the beneficiary's designation says, we'll leave it to little Johnny, right, Johnny Jr., uh, but if he's not alive, then it goes to Johnny's kid or his descendants or his heirs. You have not named people. And so you have to figure that out by September 30th uh, of, of the year following death. There's an October 31 rule, which is the Halloween rule, which means if you're leaving something to a trust, that trust has to be delivered to the custodian by December 3rd, by October 31. By December 31, if a minimum distribution is required to come out, it must be, it must come out and the account must be set up. Uh, by that December 31. So the short answer is, how long do you have? You have the full calendar year after death. So if somebody dies in 2022, and you do nothing in 2023, that all that money comes out at the end of 2023, all of it. So you're you're stuck in a one year bucket. So I know it was a little bit long, long, long winded answer. Uh, If RMD age changes to 72 from 70 and a half, um, Which did happen. That already happened. It's proposed. It's it's in effect that it's already 72 and it may get proposed to go to 75 if Secure Act 2.0 starts work, circling the wagon in Congress. Yeah. So the question is the qualified charitable distribution, can, can it be done from 72 only and not from 70 and a half? I think no, it can be done from 70 and a half. So they did not change that with respect to the QCD. Yeah. And, and Chuck asks, um, 
Chuck, I hope this is actually you and not your wife. I know Chuck's been in the hospital, so I hope hopefully you're out. Uh, since the stock market is down quite a bit, do you think this is a great opportunity for a Roth conversion? Yes. yes. <laughs> but the problem- I mean, obviously it needs what? to make sense for you, but- Yeah, but the, what's the problem with that? The problem with that, that is you have- know what the rules are going to be, right? Well, sure. we know that we we aren't too concerned because the only thing that we're proposed we're concerned if someone has earned income over 450, you know, we'd have to look at the married filing versus individual brackets. But if they have earned income and like let's just say they're a business owner and they want to do a Roth conversion strategy, I'm taking a pause on those until we have some more clarity. But let's just say that they're retired, they're not going to have a lot of earned income this calendar year that we're, we're still pursuing modeling all of those. And so it's kind of a, it, we just have to look at your particular tax situation and see what we're dealing with. But um, if we kind of go, I, I think I, on the next slide, I just talked about a couple kind of sweet spot, like where is there a sweet spot for some people that it just not, not all size fits all, you know, one size fits all, but it, this is a um, kind of a real sweet spot for ideal situations. So if someone retires early and they're going to have several years of low income and we can maximize a specific tax bracket and do several years of conversion. So I know that I think one of the questions in the queue is, do you have to do a Roth conversion all in one year or can you do it as a multi-year? You can definitely do it as a multi-year. It just depends on what tax strategy we're trying to work and what time, what, what we're doing to model things. Um, but in particular, if you've got, um, a several years of low income, I was a perfect example. I've seen this quite a bit lately. People are retiring early and especially with, um, you know, pension, you know, whether it be, I've got a couple, you know, uh, state workers, police department, um, CalPERS, um, people that are going to have a pension and, and they've got the ability to retire, you know, 56 to 60 ish even if they're retiring 65, that means you're going to have so many years where your only income is maybe pension, maybe social security, but you don't have a lot of high income that's taxable. We can look at front loading some of the, the Roth conversions each year into those earlier years. I had a client yesterday where we're forecasting $184,000 in taxes, just taxes from the required distributions of the two IRAs in 15 years. And so we forecast that out and extrapolate that based on the rate of return in the IRAs. That's what they're looking at in, in 15 years if we don't start addressing that now. And we looked at their tax bill in certain years that are, you know, right now, low, if we can front load a little bit of those taxes into earlier years, we can model what's that future year going to look like if we do all this conversion between now and 2029. Assuming that 2029 could be theoretically the last window of opportunity, we want to model it an annual conversion between now and then. And is there a break even? Do we have enough time? Someone that's on the younger retirement side, we have a lot of wiggle room. That's an ideal situation. Um, also, when we have a significantly younger spouse, Jim, I might let you talk about that because um, when there's a pretty good age gap between spouses, you can do a quadro within married couples. Yeah. So um, there's a little quirk in the law. You can do this with a 401k. You cannot do it with an IRA. And so this is why it's really, really important. If you have a 401k and you're looking to separate from your company and retire, you really need to engage an expert, really a team. And this is the value. I work a lot with Christine on a lot of matters and we work with, a, with several CPAs and, and we get together and we figure this stuff out. So here's what's going on here. If you're going to turn seven, if you, if that you say, Hey, I know I'm going to be 72 in a couple of years. My wife is 10 years younger than me. You can do what is called a qualified domestic relations order while you're married that transfers my 401k, which is community property to my wife, who's 10 years younger. She's actually older, but in this case, let's just call her younger. She's actually older than me in real life. But let's say I transfer this to my spouse who's 10 years younger. Guess what? We're delaying by 10 years any minimum distributions coming out. So, you know, tax deferral, that is a tax deferral strategy. It's not as great as tax avoidance, but the tax deferral strategy can be a very valuable tool. Again, depending um, 
uh, you know, if it's the right, if it's a right fit. You know, Especially we have to- if you've got a 70 year old 401k, let's just say someone's retiring later, if they're 70, they're, their yeah. spouse is 60, they're retiring at 70, they do a quadra while they're still, you know, working as the 401k, get it to the, to the wife, and then we can convert to an IRA if it makes sense and do Roth conversions if that suits the client's needs. So we have a lot more plan- time. It gives us a 10 year window you know, 12 year window to start planning those conversions. And we don't have to do it all at once and see if there's a sweet spot, especially if they're retiring and having less taxable income. So, um, so this is really, yeah, let me just say one thing on this, Christina, you know, a lot of times when we meet with clients, they say, well, my, my current advisors aren't, aren't doing this and they go back to them and the advisors say, oh yeah, we can do that. Something you need to understand is it's not your job as a mm-hmm. consumer to prompt your advisors to do this planning for you. You need to seek out the advisors. And it's, I would say this is not all advisors. It's a small group. It's the 80-20 rule, I guess. Seek out the advisors who are proactive, who are going to prompt you and say, you know, if you do this, this, and this in a slightly different way, you can save money. We were in a meeting last year. We saved our client $300,000 in income tax because we made a distribution from a trust. And we wouldn't have figured that out unless there were a bunch of smart people in the room, um, you know, uh, figuring it out. So there's a value in assembling your A team. There's a value in seeking out uh, the advisors. And what I've seen, folks, is this is how families become rich. This is not about individuals becoming rich as much as it is about creating a lasting legacy for generations. So Ray asks, isn't the five-year rule related to the initial Roth? If you already had a Roth set up five years ago, Whatever else you put in afterward is included in the five year, the five years previous. So no penalty. It's a question mark. Is that true, Christina? It's unclear. Unclear. I I, I, I try to tell people that it's really like for each conversion, it's five years. Okay. But it's uh, that's kind of how the safer way to do it if we were audited because it's it is unclear. Um, and I will say there is a caveat that just because you have an IRA and it could still be a million dollars, it doesn't mean that a Roth conversion will make sense either. I mean, you could be 71 and it's just, there's not a lot of tax planning or other assets to do tax mitigation. It's not, there's no break even point. You need that income to live off of. So I want to be very clear that just because you might have a very sizable IRA does not mean that a Roth conversion may make sense. Um, it might also mean that we spend down some of your IRA in certain years, as opposed to taking income from your non-tax, you know, your non-taxable accounts. Um, we just might want to look at that too. So it's- yeah, another, another um, sort of, trigger is if you have a spouse that, um, you know, maybe needs some in-home care or maybe is in a, in some type of facility, sometimes it makes sense to take money out of the IRA because you're getting big deductions for the in-home care costs. So there are a lot of variables in here and this yes. is most important to engage in a team. So Jim asks, uh, you know, sometimes we get Canadians sneaking in here. So Jim asks, uh, if your IRA beneficiary is a charity, do they need to pay taxes on the IRA? What if the charity is in Canada? Does a Canadian charity have to be recognized as a U.S. charity? I they I believe so. Yeah, I think so. Typically, if it's a large enough charity, they might have um, they might have a uh, essentially a, a U.S. Um, portal where you can make a contribution. So yeah, and I think it's a five year rule for charity, at least under the Secure Act. It looks like for you know charities, it's a five year rule that it has to go out to the charities. And so, you know, obviously some of these are probably gonna be more nuanced individual okay. cases. Gerald asks, can you convert an IRA gradually into a Roth? Yes, we answered that. Um, Anonymous asks on the September 30, 2023 deadlines is an example, the same whatever the date of death is in 2022. Yes. So it is all these triggering dates, September 30, October 31, December 31, occur in the year following death of the participant. So that is correct. Susan asks, does, 600, does a $600,000 inheritance count toward that $450,000 earned income? I would say no. If you just got a money coming out of a bank, right, a bank account, you got a check for $600,000. That is not earned income. Earned income is, you know, you getting up and going to work. You know, you might drive to work. You might just 
walk two feet from where you slept, right? And work at a desk, I guess, if you're working from home, but it's money that appears on a W-2 or a 1099, that's earned income. Anonymous asks, what's the best way to get a hold of Christina? We need some, need some help with tax planning. So I guess we'll talk about that. Yeah, I think we've got a slide that just kind of has our, our um, contact information and um, as we kind of wrap this up, but um, yeah, there's definitely specific questions to ask about, you know, the Roth IRA and uh, conversion strategy. And it requires a team that really understands how to model this. Is there a break even, you know, if you're, if you're terminally ill and you don't have you know, much of a legacy and you're not really worried about taxes and you're not gonna have time to overcome the tax consequence, it, it, there's so many nuances that we just need to make sure that this makes sense. And uh, another way is an IRA strip out strategy rather than doing a conversion where we start spending down that IRA in certain years. And we can also utilize doing some of those conversions or you know, strip outs to buy a life insurance policy that has time to marinate and that life insurance policy can provide a death benefit that would, you know, should you die before you're able to receive the income benefits from that can cover essentially what you paid in taxes on pulling money out of the IRA. There'll be a death benefit that would, would go tax-free to your spouse. Should you not outlive that break-even point? And so doing a, um, a, a combo strategy is oftentimes what we'll do. We'll do some conversions and we'll do some strip out. And with a life insurance policy, it might offer um, additional long-term care benefits that you don't have. Um, but you can also look at a potential cash value accumulation version of a life insurance policy if you're insurable, where we can take out income from that policy tax-free at a later date. Um, and so that's also another strategy. And it's not a yes or it's, it could be a yes and. And so we want to look at a strip out as well. And is that suitable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, you, you were hitting on a theme of suitability. It's got to be right for you. And there's really, there is no one size fits all uh, on this. So uh, our offices, we've got Northern and Southern California, go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube page. If you're watching this on YouTube, also you can share it. If you think this is valuable information you might want to share with your friends or loved ones, go, please share that. And if you like what you're seeing, please go ahead and review us on Google. We will turn, we'll open it up to questions. And what's the best way to contact you, Christina? Yeah. I uh, Jim, if you go back to the um, intro slide, it just shows my contact information. And um, I know it only has me on there. And, um, but we have a team, we're an office of 10. We have, you know, four certified financial planners here. Um, so there's, you know, we really work as more of a team approach. So, um, you know, sometimes it might be me that's working with the client, you know, running point. Sometimes it's going to be um, to the other CFPs. And so we just we do have a very strong bench depth here. And um, this is the best way to reach out to us. And uh, we can have someone on our team, you know, get in touch with you. But just because I'm the one in the face here, it's we've got a very competent team that helps with a lot of our um modeling for a lot of these client cases. And, and you've got offices in Northern and Southern California, which is, which is very correct. Hard. So anonymous asks, can you buy cash value life insurance with IRA money? You'd have to do it as a strip out. So we'd have to account for paying the taxes. And so that's really where, again, it requires a consultation and a plan and to see if that could be something that makes sense. And you know, what we've done with other clients, Christina, is they say, all right, I'm 62. I know I'm going to have these RMDs when I'm 72. You might do a strategy that takes several years to implement because you might be in doing investment strategies that give you a tax benefit that offset the taxes. So just because this money is taxable does not mean that taxes will actually be paid. Richard right. asks, will you be discussing the provision that lets you take 125000 out of a qualified plan without paying taxes and buy an annuity? And does that apply to SEP IRAs? I'm not familiar with being able to take money out, it would stay in a qualified, if it comes out of a qualified status, there's a tax due. If it stays within a qualified um, plan, I think you were referring to probably a qualified plan and an ERISA plan versus an IRA. And it's a newer area. The ERISA plan offered annuities that guarantee income are not typically as great as a IRA annuity. And so oftentimes that would require, again, some an, an analysis to see, should a rollover be done first to offer a, brighter, a, a wider net of annuities that might be suitable? 
And we got uh, one last question here. Christina, are you a fiduciary? Can you explain what that is? This is me talking. Can you explain what that is and give them the answer? Absolutely. So I am a fiduciary. Every single advisor in our office is a fiduciary. Uh, so we might have some licensed junior advisor planners, but anyone that is an actual advisor in our office is a certified financial planner. So not only are we fiduciaries because we do advisory uh, directed accounts that were licensed, you know, um, we hold our licenses with the SEC and FINRA, but we're also held to a higher ethics standard uh, with the certified financial planner board. So, you know, I think the numbers are still less than 20% between 15 and 20. I don't have the most current numbers of uh, financial um, advisors or licensed advisors that are out there are actually carrying the certified financial planner designation. And, and every single lead advisor in our office has that designation. It is a fiduciary. Anonymous asks, cash value life insurance can be bought with IRA strip out strategy. What is an IRA strip out strategy? It's where you take the money out of your IRA, pay the tax, and contribute that to a life insurance policy. That's basically it in a nutshell. So, all right. Well, Christina, thank you very much. And thank you for spending time with us. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, Jim. Take care.